Welcome back. Ray Avery is a living example of the so-called number eight wire approach to Kiwi ingenuity, but he's no amateur. He is both a skilled engineer and a scientist, and he wasn't even born in New Zealand, if truth be told. His troubled childhood saw him growing up without family and surviving on his own while living on the streets of London. But since then, his imagination and ingenuity have restored the sight of millions of people suffering from cataracts thanks to his work on the interocular lens. And he's currently working on projects that could save the lives of millions more. It's probably not surprising that he's been voted New Zealander of the Year and the New Zealander we most trust as a nation. Alan Lee went to see Sir Ray Avery as he now is and found him hard at work on a new invention. It looks like some sort of space-age travel pod from the Jetsons, but it's actually an incubator, designed for places where normal incubators can't function and unfortunately often take the lives of the young babies they're trying to save. So this then becomes the prototype design, yeah. and uh, as you can see, it's ironically it turns out to be an egg-shaped because that gives us the best um, distribution of air within the unit. And we spend a lot of time with the aerodynamics inside and they led to the outside shape so it's quite different uh, than a normal incubator so um, we can make all of this for about I uh, um, fell in love with New Zealand from the moment I got here and um, knew that I was going to stay um, the Kiwis have an innate DNA which is uh, exponential they they like to do things and they like to um, make a difference you know. and take it away to I was um, in retrospect I was blessed with a very challenging uh, upbringing I lived with my parents for a while, and, uh, but they were a dysfunctional family. My mother and father were, um, uh, well, they liked to go out and party, which really didn't include me. Uh, but there was a lot of violence in the home. And, uh, I remember at one occasion my mother ran for the security of the bathroom, and my father decided to chop the door down with an axe, and the police were called, and she jumped out the window, broke a leg. Um, my father took, went bush and ran off, and I was left to look after mum with a broken leg. So, um, like some 350,000 other kids in the post-war Britain arena, we were you know, lost and put into the system, into a governmental institutionalised system. And eventually, at the age of about uh, 13 and a half, I ran away uh, from the orphanage for the last time. I'd been practising for a while. I'd actually run away several times. Um, and the trains in England are fantastic <laughs> because you get on the train and be 50 miles away in an hour or so. You know, uh, and I think that's what led me to be, become self-sustainable. I, for a very early age, I had to be. You know, I had to rely on the little ray inside to survive. And that's been a great um, catharsis for what was to come later. So at 14, you were on the streets. What was that like? To get out of the cold in the English winter, I'd go to the library. I'd go to the library from about uh, nine in the morning after I finished my paper round. I'd go and find something to eat. Um, you could go to Lyons Corner House and get a coffee and sit there for two hours. So uh, I'd go and have some of that. Then I'd go to the library and I would be there with all these old codgers, you know, that have the Gannix raincoats on and their caps. And I'd hide behind a pile of books because inevitably, sooner or later, somebody would say, why aren't you at school? And I'd say, well, study leave. I've been given study leave. You know, so I'd change, change different, to different libraries to, to avoid that. That's a long way from, from being under that railway arch to, to being a successful scientist. So how did that happen? Oh, the most pivotal thing uh, was to meet a guy called Jack Wise, who was a teacher and a uh, prison visitor. He used to go every Saturday and Sunday to visit prisoners in, in, uh, in uh, one of the major prisons in southern England. And he was called in, uh, once I was picked up off the streets by the, the cops, um, to rehabilitate me. And he uh, had a connection with the Y College in, in Kent. Uh, and that was a satellite um, part of the University of London. And he got me a job there as a technician. And I remember when I first got there, they said, Good Lord, Ray, you can't talk properly. You can't possibly go through life without you know, learning some proper skills. You don't know what brie to order with what wine. Good Lord. We're going to have to fix that, right? And they did. They, they not only taught me good science, but they taught me how to talk properly and what wine to order. And they uh, changed my life in the sense that they gave me the tools and the skills to... Because you can be intelligent, but if you have no way of communicating who you are to the world at large. So they taught me good communication skills. And also how to be... Uh, in those days, I was all of um, uh, 18 or 19 when I left Y. Um, but I was already a young gentleman. Uh, you know, I had the Italian suit and, I, uh, and that of course got me into a lot of trouble with the female persuasion because um, I was looking for love 
you know, and I had all these skills, these exquisite skills, to be able to seduce women and, um, and, and find Nirvana that I thought. So I thought if I had money and a good looking woman on my arm, I would have been rehabilitated. Um, and after giving it a good shot in the 60s, <laughs> from, from the age of about 16 to 26, I realised that um, I actually didn't like myself particularly much. You know, I, uh, when you have six or seven girlfriends on the go, you have to become a consummate liar and um, and it was just getting too much for me in terms of what I wanted to be. So I left to find uh, myself and to find a country uh, that I could live in. And I spent a year travelling over land, uh, India, Pakistan. You could drive all the way from London to Kathmandu in those days. And arrived in 1973, washed up on the floor, uh, shores of New Zealand. And it was instant love because I walked through the uh, international terminal, which was, is now the domestic terminal, but in 1973, it was little more than a tin shed, you know. It had these open rafters, and flying in those rafters were all of these birds. And there's a bloke there in a swan dry and an air rifle shooting them. <laughs> and I thought, that's the country for me. They don't muck around with bait. <laughs> it sounds almost incredible that, that you can start with the background that you had, end up in a new country, and have a career like the one you've had. Do you ever look, look back and and say, how did that happen? Oh, I think I'm like an Italian racing driver. Um, I don't worry what's behind me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, the, the world changing things that we're doing, people often say to me, what's um, the best thing that you've invented? And if you did that, uh, I, I'm also quite a competent painter. And it would be like doing a painting and saying, that's the best painting I've ever done. I mean, you wouldn't do another one, would you? If, so, so you have to have that notion um, of, of, of a voyage of discovery. Alan Lee talking there with Sir Ray Avery and they'll be back after the break with one of his latest inventions. Welcome back. If Sir Ray Avery's autobiography was a book of fiction, you might find it hard to believe. But as Alan Lee discovered, a childhood that would have crushed most people developed in him a razor-sharp mind which is never short of ideas. We rejoin him as he's explaining one of his latest, a medical device which on the face of it seems simple, but which could save the lives of thousands of people. And this is what's used to administer and control the flow of mm -hmm. intravenous drugs, particularly in a developing country. And as you can see, oh, when you look at the drops coming yeah. through here, that's full flow and that's off. And yeah. so you've got probably about three millimetres of movement between yeah. wow. on and off. And in real life, that's three millimetres of difference between life and death. So um, what we needed was something that was more accurate to control the flow of intravenous fluids. In our country, we fixed it. We have microprocess control pumps, yeah. which cost maybe two and a half to five thousand dollars. So we invented this, which um, is a device called the Accuset, and um, you can clip it on to the outside of the tubing, which means that you can use it for different patients, because oh, yes, once yes. you're finished, you can just take you it off. So this will revolutionise um, intravenous infusion therapy in the developing country setting. Um, we can make these and get them to the end user for about $5 US. So this means that um, we can bridge that gap between the um, pumps that cost 2500 and something that's absolutely reusable and absolutely unbreakable. <laughs> You don't have to spend much time with Ray to realise that he generates ideas with an almost breathless efficiency. Even as he was talking to us about a high-intensity light system which sterilises air entering a baby incubator, we were aware that he was looking at our camera crew's equipment and thinking of improvements to make them better. His move into working in the developing world would probably have come as a bit of a shock to the system. I, I finished my tenure at uh, Douglas Pharmaceuticals and decided to start up my own company designing and building pharmaceutical plants in developing countries to stop the multinational cartels keeping prices at a high level. And a friend of mine at medical school said, look, Fred Hollows is coming to say goodbye to his family in New Zealand. And uh, I think you could help him build these laboratories in the Paul Narrow Trail. So I expected a business meeting. And I went to the Sheraton Hotel and knocked on the suite that he was staying at. So a whole cacophony of noise coming from inside. When I got inside, Fred was there, but there was also about 140 people and the introduction went something along the lines of my friend, uh, who's a doctor at med school, said, this is Ray Avery, he's one of New Zealand's premier pharmaceutical scientists, designs plants all over the world. He can help you build your lab in Nepal and Eritrea. Fred didn't look at me when this great oration was going on. He just looked at the guy next and says, yeah, but he's any good. And he turned on his heels and walked off into the crowd. 
So I've always had a, a board bullies, you know, and I went after Fred, grabbed his arm and said, Fred, they tell me you're dying of cancer and I charge a thousand dollars in our consultancy fees. None of us have got much time. Do you want to talk or not? And he said, give this guy a whiskey, I like him. <laughs> and a week later I was in Sydney plotting the first plant in Eritrea. And of course when I got to Eritrea, uh, the war had only just finished. Uh, it was nine months after independence. And uh, it was a terrible diaspora. There was no way on God's earth we could build a plant there. There was a woman, uh, an Eritrean woman, with her basha shawl and a child on her back. And um, started to get distressed in the heat. And they removed the... Um, shawl and underneath the baby's face had been burned to the bone with napalm burns and I'd never seen war close up and personal so I left the queue, I didn't know what to do, went back to my hotel room but in that night sleeping under that, uh, I had no mattress, it was a wire bed with a blanket over it and it was no different than being under the railway bridge and it was, had a little LED light from my alarm clock trying to read something and I thought you haven't come very far Ray Avery, you know you were living under a railway bridge and here you are and that was the moment of catharsis as I thought if I survived all of that, I can do this. So I got up the next morning and phoned Gabby and said, look, it's going to be difficult, but I promise I'll do it. And we did. It took two years um, and a lot of work, but we absolutely built it, and that meant we could collapse the world price of interocular lenses, getting the price down from about $360 down to about today's price is about $7. You know. So we were able to flood the market, collapse the price, and now there's some 16 million people walking around with those lenses made with the technology that we invented, you know, which is great. We, we tend to see the world that it, like it's our world, um, that this is, this is the real world. But in fact, 90% of the, the world's population are underprivileged, so they don't have access to mobile phones or good health care and so on. So we're talking about universal problems. So we're talking at least 5 million kids a year die bit through being put in into an incubator that's not got the right parameters or the right security for them. Um, so what happens in our society is we fix things for us. And then when we fix them, we find things that we enjoy. So we buy an Xbox and do the next thing. In developing countries, most people aren't getting uh, clean water, they don't get vaccinations, they don't get all the health care. And I guess my blessing is that I come from an environment that knows what it's like to be underprivileged. And I actually have some skills that might help to get them to a better state of grace. So that's what I do. I get up in the morning and say, and also I think... Um, it justifies what's went on before. You know, if, if I can make a difference, then it justifies the heartache that went before. And also, I've got a new leveller, that is that my daughters, I want them to think their dad was a good bloke. You know, I really do. I want them to think that, they, that, he, that he's a really great bloke. So I've got to try harder. Uh, and that also, when I had Anastasia, and I held her for the first time at the hospital, she was 3, three kg. A lot of the babies in developing countries are weighing only in a, a, a kilo to a kilo and a half. And that's when it really hit me. I mean, I'd watched uh, all of the issues with um, babies dying in developing countries. But one of the things that you have when you come from a kind of challenging background is you learn not to let your emotions loose because you just get on and deal with things. So I was able to analyse what needed to be fixed without being emotionally connected to the problem. I knew there was a problem would fix it. But when I held Anastasia, I cried because I thought of all those women in Africa whose babies are going to die because they don't get a chance of being put in the right incubator. Um, so that made me you know, bring forward, fast forward the incubator project and, and phone up all my mates and say, we've got to treat this as a matter of urgency. You know, I, I don't want to lose any more kids. Now, having children makes you even more selfless. Um, but in my case, it's made me more resolute about the things that I do. I want them to uh, respect me because I uh, have done some good things in the world and I want... Um, them hopefully to go on and perhaps carry on a little bit of the science. Amelia comes in here with me and works with me well and she can fill up containers. And she, <laughs> so she, by the time she's seven, she will have her own range of cosmetics, no doubt. Hi, Yes, give me a, give me a high five.